Uh, thank you. Uh, I was desperately trying to think of a joke to kind of break this oppressive silence. Too long a delay. Um, I would like to thank the organizers and ICTS for uh, this conference and for the uh, great facilities uh, that we have here. Um, and I'm in the position where I can actually skip most of my preliminaries that I would usually talk about because between Pierre's course last week and John's talk this week, uh, most of the things about complex hyperbolic geometry and basics about complex hyperbolic triangle groups have been mentioned one way or the other, so I'll jump right in. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, most of the talk is joint work um, uh, with my former student, Andrew Monaghan. and with uh, John Parker. And the situation that we're going to look at in this cartoon sort of way is that we have three complex lines in the complex hyperbolic plane. And ultra parallel stands for those lines not intersecting inside the complex hyperbolic plane. So, sort of like this in the real hyperbolic case, and this will be our picture for the complex hyperbolic case, even though the real picture is higher dimensional. Uh, the real picture of the complex. Okay, and we have three complex reflections in those three complex lines. And as John mentioned, the, in complex hyperbolic case, the reflections can be of order higher than two, but for now we will have uh, them of order two. Yeah? There is no intersection on inside. I mean, parabolic elements are possible, but... Like this. And we, we can allow that, yes. Um, yeah. um. complex reflection in these lines, and for now they are all of order two. And, um, so how can we parameterize such triples of complex lines? Um, John told you two days ago. Um, up to conjugation. Now, in the case where they intersect inside the complex hyperbolic space, 
like this, we can look at the angles between them. Here we don't have angles, but we can look at the distances, pairwise distances between those complex lines. Um, We have four real parameters, one more than in the real hyperbolic plane, and three of them are the same ones that we might expect in the real hyperbolic case. So the three distances between those lines and the fourth one okay so um in drone stock there were number sigma tau and rho, and John looked at the real part of the product, but also said we could look at the argument, so I'm going to look at the argument. Um, so, um, something defined in a similar way, what John had, the fourth parameter, that um, describes the shape of this triangle after we fix the distances between the lines. Okay. And John had the picture with parameter going from minus eight to eight, mine goes to, from zero to Pi and the case of alpha equals zero corresponds to the triangle just sitting uh, to the corresponding uh, group or triangle in the real hyperbolic plane. Draw in the real hyperbolic plane, three geodesics with the prescribed distances, M1, M2, M3, and that is that we can embed into the complex hyperbolic plane by putting this real hyperbolic plane inside HC2. And then we start to, defo to deform away from it and from the conjectural pictures that we've seen, we would expect, so of course, the corresponding um, reflection group in the real hyperbolic plane is discrete. And so we expect that it will stay discrete for some time, and then something happens, and maybe it stops being discrete. Um, So I should have said this somewhere here, that gamma is the group generated by those three reflections. Okay. And now what is this something that happens? Now, according to uh, the conjectures uh, that John talked about, on Tuesday, something happens is particular elements turning from loxodromic to elliptic through parabolic. Um, 
According to Richard Schwartz's conjecture, uh, something happens is, depending on the type of the group, one of those two elements uh, stops being loxodromic and moves through parabolic to elliptic and causes the group not to be discrete anymore. Uh, but because this conjecture is for the case where the three lines intersect inside the complex hyperbolic plane. So not necessarily for our case. Um, Now we assume here that M1 is M1, M2, M3, the distances are ordered in this way. We can order them any way we like. And then we allow here the case that some of them are zeros, which then corresponds to them intersecting on the boundary. So, um, In particular, if they're all zero, so they each pair intersects on the boundary. That's the case sort of between the ultra parallel ones and the RST ones. And that's the ideal complex hyperbolic triangle group in which this conjecture is completely confirmed. Um, by uh, Goldman Parker and Richard Schwartz. And another case that has been looked at is the case where two of them coincide and one is zero. So. Like that. By Justin Viscalifan in and I'm going to look at the more general case, including those two, the case of M3 equals zero. We have one intersection on the boundary. It's not necessarily symmetric. Okay. Um, so what what does this do? So we have those three reflections are one or two or three. 
And all those pictures have a, give us some idea of what's happening, but they're a bit of a cartoon of the real higher dimensional situation. So I want to look at what happens on the boundary of the complex hyperbolic plane where we can actually draw proper pictures uh, that are in the right dimension. And so the aim will be to look at this discrete part or part of it and to try to see how far one can show that this interval of discreteness goes. So that. Now, if you think of the complex hyperbolic plane as a ball, then the boundary is a sphere. And under the stereographic projection, we can make it into R3 and infinity. Or we prefer to think of it as C cross R and infinity. And the right sort of structure to think of um, on the boundary is the Heisenberg group structure. So you can think of the upper triangle as three by three matrices with ones on the diagonal, or you can just write the formula for the group action. the same as what comes out of the matrix multiplication. Okay. And so in particular, the action of this group on itself um, corresponds to the action of the isometries of complex hyperbolic plane on the boundary. Um, okay, and we have the, we can put the metric onto the boundary that fits with the um, complex hyperbolic metric inside. Okay, so what do we see of the picture inside in the boundary? Now, if we look at a complex line and we look at what, how it cuts the boundary, It's a chain, and okay, the chain is um, some circle on the boundary. And if we project into the Heisenberg group with a stereographic projection, we can see what those chains look like. Now we have two types of chains, the ones that go through infinity and they're just vertical lines. And then the ones that do, don't go through infinity They are 
ellipses which project to circles in the complex plane. Take some circle here and we lift it in a particular way into C cross R. Now, in particular, the one that will be the one um, finite chains. Those are called vertical chains. Those are called finite chains, and one of them is just the unit circle in the complex plane. So we're looking at our configuration of complex lines up to conjugation, so we can rearrange in such a way that infinity is this point here where they intersect, so the two complex lines L1 and L2 become vertical chains, and we can wriggle around to make the third one this unit circle. And then the distances M1 and M2 will determine how far those vertical lines are outside the unit circle. Now, they must be outside um, because there is no intersection inside the complex hyperbolic plane. If there was an intersection, we would get vertical lines inside the circle. So. Up to conjugation. Chains that correspond to our complex lines. Are like this. One and C2 are vertical. C3 is the unit circle. And C1 and C2 are outside C3. Mm -hmm. And the distance from the origin to those points where C1 and C2 go through um, is determined by the distances M1 and M2, and the angle invariant that we had there uh, controls the angle, the argument of those points where the vertical chains hit through the complex plane. Now, what do the reflections do? Uh, on the boundary, now the reflections in vertical lines, now for the complex reflections in the complex hyperbolic plane, we said they fix uh, the complex lines and they sort of rotate around them and it's not so easy to see how they do it. Now here we can see it actually quite explicitly because so if we restrict to the boundary in this projected, spherographically projected way, 
they fix those vertical chains and they rotate around them, at least in projection onto the complex plane. So reflections of order two in the vertical. The projection to C is a rotation to pi around this line. Now it might also have some vertical components, so in the third direction it might shift things. And what is the third reflection in the finite chain? Now, on the complex plane, we see a reflection in this in inversion in this circle. And if you want to see what it does on the whole of uh, the Heisenberg group, now so it, it swaps around the point that corresponds to zero and the point that corresponds to infinity. And so it fixes the bisector between them. Um, and what we see of this bisector on the boundary is topologically a sphere. And it looks um, it's not quite a sphere. Um, if we had square here, it would be. So it's a slightly flattened sphere. Um, and the reflection. inverses um, the boundary with respect to the spinal sphere, throws the inside to the outside, outside to the inside, and fixes this spherical shape. So we've got two reflections sort of rotating around those vertical lines, and one swaps things around with respect to this sphere. And so we want to understand is this discrete, the group generated by those three things. And 
first result I want to um, tell you about is the following. Those are the two words from the Schwartz conjecture that were in charge of the group failing to be discrete and I'm adding another family, infinite family of words which are sort of related to WA. equal one, it is WA, and then yeah, longer words come here. And If certain conditions on traces of those elements are satisfied, then we can show that the group must be discrete. And I'll tell you in a second what those conditions have to do with loxodromic, elliptic, and so on. Um, right, so um, it's a familiar idea that the trace of an element tells you what type it is, whether it's elliptic, hyperbolic, or parabolic, like in the PSL2R case, the modulus of trace larger than 2, smaller than 2, and equal to 2. And in the complex hyperbolic case, it's slightly more complicated. have a sort of deltoid shape in the complex plane, and if the trace lands inside this triangle, then the element is elliptic, and outside it's loxodromic, and on it it can be parabolic, but also some special elliptic elements are there as well. Um, and this deltoid can be described explicitly. So if we look at our elements, uh, WA to the power K, this element has a real trace. real axis, and it's actually always larger or equal to minus 1. So for it to be larger or equal to 3 corresponds exactly to it being loxodromic or parabolic. is larger or equal to 3 is exactly the condition that it's not elliptic. Now, um, the real part of this trace less or equal to minus 5 Because means that it's away from the deltoid, so it's definitely loxodromic, but it's not an if and only if. Um, 
uh, those conditions are related to the condition of those elements not being elliptic, but not, not sharp everywhere. groups where we have intersections inside the complex hyperbolic plane, the conjecture was that these two elements determine discreteness. If they are loxodromic, then the group is discrete. And in the ultra parallel case, we get extra elements that we have to keep track of. Um. And so that's a short statement, but it can be made more precise in the sense we can say for which choices of M1 and M2, which element plays a role. Like in the uh, Schwartz conjecture, there was a type A and type B. So here we have type, maybe a type A, type B, and type A, A, or something like that. Um, and I'll try to state it in a way which is not uh, frightening and doesn't have too many formulas in it. We say that gamma is discrete for the values of the invariant from zero to a point where something happens, and that something is that the particular element in the group um, stops being loxodromic. And which word it is Um... 
So this is the M1, M2 space in certain coordinates, which if you want to know are those, and probably you don't. Um, Um, so the M1, M2 plane is divided into areas, into such form of um, rectangular, um, no, not rectangular, quadrangular areas, and the unbounded area here, and then everything above. Um, and depending on the area, different elements are the ones that disturb discreteness first. And that's... Okay, so those lines, they have precise coordinates uh, that are described um, in the preprint, but um, that's probably as much detail as you might ever want to know uh, at this stage. Um, so it is possible to say for each choice of M1 and M2, what is the element um, that we should be looking for. Now this boundary, where we say up to there is discrete, um, is not necessarily the furthest possible one, and the nature of the proof is such that we don't claim that it is necessarily the whole interval of discreteness. But in some cases it is, because in some cases this stretches all the way across the parameter space. Um, Yeah, that the gamma is discrete for all values of the parameter alpha where the group is defined. If certain conditions on M1 and M2 are satisfied, um, for example, like this, or Like this. And what, what those conditions are basically is that M1 and M2 are not too close to each other and in some appropriate sense. Right? And, okay, that's not hugely surprising because if we look at ultra parallel groups, if, they're, um, if the lines L1, L2, L3 are far enough from each other, then we would expect it to be quite discrete because there is a lot of space there for them to avoid each other. And I'll say a little bit about where those results come from. Um, so we, if we look 
configuration that we have. If we divide um, the boundary into everything inside the spinal sphere and everything outside the spinal sphere, um, and we look at images of the inside of the spinal sphere, under the rotations, reflections are one and are two. So we get many spinal spheres floating around. Now, if We can show that all those elements, um, so products of R1 and R2, uh, move uh, the spinal sphere off itself far enough, then we can play ping pong with it. Um. that those we divided the space into two destroying sets and the reflection R3 swaps the two and every element In here, uh, sends U2 into V, which is inside U1. Um, and then using these um, two sets, we can show that for every element in the group, we can find a point which is moved away sufficiently from itself so that um, we can't have a sequence of elements converging to identity. Um. It remains to, to see that this is the case of which uh, values of the parameters, this is the case. 
And now we don't quite know what our one and our two do in the vertical direction, but we know what they do in the projection onto the complex plane. And so, if we can show that the projections of those spheres onto the complex plane are away from the unit circle, then, of course, they themselves have to be. When we project to C, what we have, what we see from R1 and R2 are just rotations through pi. We see something like that where the slope of the lines depends on our parameters. And then, okay, that's a sort of two-dimensional geometry where we have to estimate how far those points, the closest of those points is to the origin, and that produces the conditions that uh, I sketched here. Okay, uh, now that it should be possible to improve on this because we are making a number of um, moves that make the estimates less sharp than they could be. Um, so one could look at building a fundamental domain, one could look at not looking at the projection to see at this point, but at taking into account the vertical component as well. Um, and um, now I want to um, say a little bit about um, generalization of this. So at the beginning of the talk I said, uh, for now the reflections will all be of order two, um, but we can look at the higher order reflections. Recent work with uh, Sam Paul, uh, my PhD student, who's there, um, and it's uh, still work in progress. So, in the same setup, um, And look at the situation where two of the reflections now become order three reflections, and one we keep as order two one. Um, and so when we look at what's happening in this picture, 
Now R3 is still an inversion in this sphere, but R1 and R2 are rotations around those vertical lines with angle 2 pi over 3. A lot of the other things are the same, um, but this picture, of course, changes. So when we start moving zero around with two rotations with angles um, 2 pi over 3, um, here they were like nicely organized into two lines. Um, and In the case of order three, they are sort of all over the place, uh, but by looking at the pictures of what happens there, one can see a hexagonal um, symmetry in the whole picture. And um, if we look at the elements in the subgroup generated by R1, R2, if we take a product of three of them, um, that's a translation when projected to the complex plane. So we have um, if we look at those images uh, under two rotations to two pi over three. Uh, we have um, we have a finite set of points which are then moved around by a lattice generated by two vectors. And so we get some results. Um, just in the case where M1 is equal to M2. Something like that. Um, so some discreteness results um, depending on the angle invariant and the distances M1 and M2. Um, and similar results for other cases, for 2 to 4, 2 to 6, and for 2 to 3, for orders of the reflections. 
Um, and from looking at the orbits, um, it seems that for the orders five and orders larger than six, um, the picture becomes much more chaotic. And um, so maybe there is some number theoretical reason behind that, uh, that things maybe don't work out, but we don't know yet. Um, okay. um, I wanted to add that in all those cases, uh, we've also looked from the other side, so where we can have some non-discreteness results uh, using things like Shimizu lemma or uh, looking at the traces, and um, there is quite a gap still between the discreteness part and the non-discreteness part where um, we don't know what's happening. Um, okay, so that should be possible to be improved. Um, I think that's all from me, so thank you. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And the five and larger than six seems to be a problem, and that might be because there are no lattices with. Right. But, I mean, the, the way the proof is, the fact that there is no lattice is not necessarily, it just means this proof doesn't work. It doesn't necessarily tell us that it generally it doesn't work, so maybe it is possible to show that as well. You would then have a, um, a lattice in the Heisenberg group with, with those sorts of rotations, and that's not possible because those have all been classified. Right. So, so you could look at Heisenberg lattices okay. and rule things out. Okay. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So in the Simizu's lemma, you said there is a gap between discreteness and non-discreteness. What is that? Right. I mean, Shimizu lemma gives a certain part of the parameter space where the group is definitely not discrete. And then this result gives us, right, so. And then there is a gap where we don't know. Where Shimizu lemma doesn't tell us anything, and our result doesn't tell us anything. So probably maybe halfway there, somewhere, discreteness turns into non-discreteness. Uh, do we know anything about arithmeticity of the cases where you know that you have discreteness? Um, no, but I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be lattices. Right. Uh, so. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Anna again.